All right, so our series, last week we kicked off, if you were here last week, you heard me talking about Noah and how Noah modeled four important things that influencers for the gospel, in those of us today in 2023, can embrace and put forth in our own lives to be influencers. If you missed that last week, you can go back. It's on our website. It's on our app. It's on YouTube as well. You can go uh, kind of get up to speed in this series. But what we were saying last week is that God has made it so that uh, we can be influencers of the gospel. What are social media influencers? Some of you know this. Uh, these are people with great clout. They can move a product. They can evangelize. They can set kind of new trends in motion just with a little bit of this or that. And, and so these are social media influencers. God wants us as Christians, all of us, to be influencers for the gospel. And I think I'm challenging you throughout every week of this series to consider your own personal influence. When I think of influence, I think of many times I self-examine and say, okay, how am I doing with this? Because I want to be an influencer, and I'm not talking about standing here on stage, and that's important for me, but so much other influencing opportunities that I have in my own life. I think probably the time that I make the most examination of how I'm doing is the sound, maybe you can, I think some of you might could relate to this, but if I ever go to like a, a funeral or a memorial service, I really start thinking about life. I don't know if you do, especially if it's somebody very close to me. It, it sort of recaptures me to start thinking about life. I start thinking about decisions I make. I think about how it feels like life is fleeting so fast. Like the person, maybe if you knew them really well at the memorial, you, you remember just X amount of days or weeks or months or years ago that you were hanging out and doing this and doing this and now all of a sudden that time has passed. In fact, I think if you wanna be an influencer, I put in your notes a couple influencer truths. Here's the first one in your notes. If you, if you are going to be an influencer, you're going to recognize that time is short. It, it moves quick. You get uh, little moments. Even as a parent, I think about parenting, uh, you know, and, and, and I do think when you parent, you start to think about how quick time moves. But as a parent, you know, I could say, well, I have 18, 20 years, maybe whatever it is with my kids in my home. I know some of you are on the 30, 40 year plan with kids in your home, and so there's that. But like, you know, as we're raising our kids, We can come to a point where we could look back and say, man, that sure went quick. Even in that 18 to 20 years, you know, you consider how many hours you were sleeping, how many hours you were working, and even in that time slot there of 18 to 20 years, it's really a, a limited amount of time to be involved in the things that they're doing, and not to mention how quick it goes as well. Everybody always tells you, man, you have kids, boy, they grow up fast, and they do. Your opportunity to influence your own children for the gospel and prepare them. It, it, it's short. I, I was reading this scripture here. I put it in my notes. It'll be up on the screen. Jesus says, we, gotta, we must quickly carry out our tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. Jesus got an assignment by God. You and I as believers have an assignment to, to follow through, to See it play out in, in our lives. You were created with purpose. You were created for a cause, for a reason, with destiny. God set something up inside of you that was unique, different than anybody else, and he expects you to kind of be an influencer with what it is that he's given you, and time is short. I love what the scripture goes on. It says, the night is coming, and then no one can work. It, 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 the, the moments of influence come to an end. So we don't want to miss those moments. Here's the next thing that I think influencers embrace is that what we do matters. When we're actively involved and in influencing for our faith, it matters. And when you miss those moments, it matters. Our influence matters, the things that we're involved in. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you understand that 
there is a work to be done here on this earth to advance the kingdom, and you also understand, the scriptures tell you and I, that there's something of a reward for the Christians in eternity for what it is we've been involved in. Remember, we don't work to make God love us more. That's religion. But once we become a believer in Christ because of the work of the cross, God gives us an assignment and says, let's get busy. You got things to do. Be an influencer. And that adds up in eternity. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3, 8. The one who plants and the one who waters, well, they work together. But each one will receive, each one will receive their own what? Reward for their own labor. Some of you uh, got a task over here to influence, and some of you got something over here. We're all working for the same purpose, is what the scripture says. And as we do our part, the Bible says there's, there's a reward for that. What we do as believers adds up. We all want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And in our desire to hear that, we ask ourselves and we evaluate, hey, am, am I getting this right? You're raising kids right now. You're a father. You're a mother. Am I getting this right? You're, you're in a marriage. Chance to influence in your marriage, influence in your home, your kids. Are you, are you making the most out of that moment to influence? You're a believer with opportunity to use your gifts and talents for the, the kingdom of God to serve in the body of believers. Are you, are you getting it right? Are you making the most of those moments? Are you making those moments count? Have you thought about the legacy you're leaving behind as an influencer for the gospel? Influencers get it. And I want you to get this right as well. When God puts something in you, a dream, a vision for your life, your family, he expects you to see that play out in the influencing opportunities you have. Here's what happens though. This, this is real life talk here. Here's what happens. Life gets hard, and you could be a believer, and I've watched this play out over and over again with people at our church. They're on fire for Jesus, and they're influencing, they're telling everybody about what Jesus has done in their life, and the forgiveness of their sin, this new path they're on, and then a moment happens. Life was tough, and it was a bad day, and a bad day becomes a bad week, and a bad week becomes a bad month, and a month becomes a bad year. And all of a sudden, and I think so much of this, when we, we hit a tough moment, we quickly, some of the things of our emotional health and, and our, our past brokenness can kind of rear its ugly head again and cause us to stumble and, and to miss out. You know, those things kind of come back to life in tough moments, so we have to handle that and deal with that with God's help. But we get into a bad day, week, month, and all of a sudden, we move from this influencing thing in our life to becoming frustrated. And then the longer it goes on, the more stuck we get, the more we start to give up on the dream and the plan and the influence and all that God has in store for us. And it brings us to a place where we start going back to low-level living. What is low-level living? It's like, I don't know the bigger purpose. All I do now is I just, I, I live for the weekend where I can get my paycheck and, and just go have a little fun and come back on Monday. Like there are people all over our community. This is the max they've got going on. They wouldn't admit it's the max, but when you get down to it, that's really it. You know, can't wait for my next vacation. I love vacations, but if that's the biggest picture you got going on, like of influence and, and making a difference, that's pretty low level. And so much of our community, like this is all they got going on. Got to get, got to get another raise. God says, man, don't get stuck in that low-level way of living. The power of influence as a believer is the ability to leave a mark and make the most of what you've got. Now, I want to bring us to a place, kind of set the table for what we're going to talk about here. I want us to look at a moment in history. Let me catch you up to this moment in history. We're going to be in a book of the Bible called Haggai, and I want to tell you what's happening here in this moment in history, what's taking place is the Israelites, well, first, you know the story of the Israelites, maybe some of you do, they were in bondage and slavery in Egypt, Moses helps lead them out, 
They're headed to the promised land. Ultimately, Joshua takes them in the promised land. They're doing really great, some battles. They're winning in the promised land. Then over time, what happens is they start forgetting about God, and so it leaves them in some really low places. They start being defeated by the enemy. The Babylonian king sends them off into exile, and they're in this kind of messy position. God brings them back to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city, be a part of rebuilding the walls, all that stuff. And then they get there, and then it stops. No shovels in the ground, nobody's getting the work done, and they're in this very low place where they're missing the moments and the opportunities that God has called them to. They're living in sort of this small-minded mentality. They're starting to drift into, it's all about me, and I can tell you this, I've watched over the years as people have missed this in their own life. They've lived an entire life and gotten to the end of their life and said, man, That was fast, and I missed some big moments. Heck, in in my own life, I can remember the first 26 years of my life, I wasn't a believer. And I can remember the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. One of the things I had to process was this thought of, man, I've missed already a chunk. And I I had to... deal with that. And I've shared before, like how I had some regret for a bit. Like there were some moments I missed. Now, God is not the author of regret and God works in us to deal with that regret. He doesn't want us to have regret. He convicts us to live differently and allow God to help heal me of that regret. But man, I I did miss some moments and This is what I put in your notes. This is the bottom line. When you miss those moments, when you miss influence, I put in your notes, it can lead to regret. And God's going to remind through Haggai, he's going to say, hey, don't miss it. It causes, it's going to cause some issues in in your life. Here's what it says in verse 5, Haggai chapter 1. It says, and then a little later, God of the angel Arby spoke out again. Here's what's happening. God is speaking through the prophet to reveal to the governor that the people are messing this thing up. They were brought to get a work done and rebuild the temple, and they've stopped. Here's what it says. Take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. That's what I'm just kind of reminding you of here today. Take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. Hey, look, you've spent a lot of money, but you don't have a lot to show for it. You keep filling up your plates, but you never get filled. You keep drinking and drinking, drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on a layer, layer of clothes, but you can't seem to get warm. And the people who you work for, they're not getting anything out of it, not much other than a leaky, rusted out bucket. That's what. Here's here's what we're getting here from God to the prophet. We're getting this, this income. And it's just, it just goes right through. Things, possessions, toys, times, moments, uh, opportunity, and and now all those moments have passed, and and it just kind of went through, and it we missed so many great opportunities. Have you been filling your life and making it about me, me, me so much that time is passing? Here's. What it says, another translation uh, says this, you put money in your pocket and it feels like it's falling through holes. I, I can identify, I can identify that as God is revealing this through Haggai. God, God is revealing this word to the people that says, you need to let them know this is a real thing that plays out and then there's consequences that come from it. He says this, God said, here's what I want you to do. Climb into the hills, he's telling Haggai, I want you all to tell them to climb into the hills, cut some timber, bring it down, rebuild the temple, do it just for me, honor me. You've had all these great ambitions for yourself, but nothing has come of it. The little you have brought to my temple, I've blown away, there was nothing to it. And why? 
Why is there nothing to it? Because while you've run around, you've been caught up taking care of your own houses while my home is still in ruins. God said, I brought you here for a reason. There's a job to do. There's a thing to get done. And everything is kind of crumbling because you're sitting kind of on the sidelines. It goes on and says this, because of your stinginess, this is why you're, you're struggling, because of your stinginess. He says, and so I've given you a dry summer and a skimpy crop. I've matched your tight-fisted stinginess. Remember in our series we did in November, we talked about tight-fisted versus open-handed living. God calls the believers to be open-handed. Because of your tight-fisted stinginess, by decreeing a season of drought, look, I've dried, we're drying up, I've dried up the fields, the hills, withering gardens, orchards, stunning vegetables and fruit, nothing, not a man or woman, not an animal or crop is going to thrive. God says, you are missing out. You're missing a, a moment. And God didn't do this They've chosen this. Remember, remember that any time you want to choose drought for your life, any time you want to choose unhealthy living for your life, God will let you. It's a choice to choose his love and to follow him. Right now, God's revealing like you've chosen, and so you're encountering what comes from missing the mark and missing the opportunities to accomplish what I brought you to do. Fast forward to the year 2023. Here we are. God brought you here this morning to New Walk Church. Do you think he brought you here for just you to take care of you? Yes, we've all got struggles, and we want God's help, but God has also brought the Christians here, gathering here in a church where we have people who who are broken and outside of this church, people who over 80% of our community that doesn't know Jesus Christ, God brought you here to a vibrant body of believers that's growing and reaching the community in a big way. Do you think he brought you here just for you? To just take care of you? There's so much more going on. And yet we all understand what has befallen the American church is instead of being influencers, we just want to be influenced. And I just want my own, I just want my own thing and I want to do it for me. And Haggai is just getting this reminder here and he's saying it. He's going to reveal it and say, hey, this is empty living. You're missing, you're missing the mark. Now, what I want to do is bring us to another moment in history that will give us, I think, the steps we need to take. And I just, want to, I just have a few steps that I want to reveal to you here in our time together as we fast forward to 1 Samuel in the scriptures and we see this moment where Israel has its king, King Saul, and Saul, well, Saul's in kind of a little messy stage here and, and, and he's got to lead God's people, the Israelites, in a battle. You know if you follow the Bible that the Israelites, the Philistines are battling, having problems and they're in this one occasion where the Israelites are on one side, Philistines are on the other, and there's this valley in the middle. And what's taking place is God's people are just kind of hanging out. They're just over here doing their thing. King Saul's not doing his part. He's being lazy. Priests are lazy. And in this moment, one guy steps up and says, we got to do something. His name is Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of the king. He sneaks out one day. He grabs somebody to go with him, known as the armor bearer, and says, we got we to gotta do something on this journey. We can take him on. Let's go. So the armor bearer follows him, and I think just in this little journey of Jonathan, who breaks away and says, I'm tired of sitting around. I just, I just want to kind of reveal some influencing opportunity to you here. I wrote this in your notes. Influencers in a church, community, family, whatever it looks like, we take these steps. Let's go to 1 Samuel 14. We find the first step in here, verse 1. It says this. One day, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, here's that moment, come on, and here's what he says. He says, let's, let's what? Go over to where the Philistines have their outposts. But Jonathan did not tell his father, the king, what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on, they were camped where? Where were they camped out? Outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree of Migron. Do you know what you can do when you're sitting on the outskirts? You, you know what you do? You watch. You sit and watch. You hang out. You're not involved. You sit. <laughs> and you watch. 
I have been blessed as a pastor, I said this last week, to watch some of these amazing steps that people have taken in our church, and there are some of you, and I'm going to be, I'm speaking some things right now, and there are people sitting here in this audience, and you're like, I get it, I, I, I get it, and you've been involved in being an influencer, and so I hope and I pray today will be a strengthening for you, but there are other believers here that while people are giving a testimony, maybe on the screen or in small groups about what God has done for their life, you just watch. And while people are parking cars, coming into the church, you just watch. And while people are taking care of the kids and the kids' ministry, you just watch. And while we're greeting and waving at people in the front area, and while the worship team's playing, and while youth night's happening, and the production team's doing what they do, you just watch. And the buckets pass, and it's time for the offering, or to give online, or whatever it may be, and you just watch, and you let other people do it. This, this is not what influencers do. The gospel, and I talk to people, and, they, and you'll hear all kinds of reasons. They got some great reasons, and I don't think anybody is not involved in sitting around watching because they're mean, but they reveal things. They'll say things like, well, pastor, we'd really like to, and we really like your church, and it's really cool, and soon in one day, soon, one day we're going to get involved, but right now it's not a good time because our kids are young. And then it's the kids grow up, well, they're, they're in high school, and we got to go do all their stuff, and so we just don't have time. Or maybe you're in high school, or you're in college, and you're like, one day when I'm all finished, you know, I'll, I'll get involved. Maybe when my career gets a little better, or I make a little bit more, or I get to this level in the business, and then I'll have a little bit more time. This is what the outskirts do. This is what the watchers say. This is the language of people who aren't influencers. This is what they're saying. Pastor, I know the buckets are passing, but one day when I win the lottery, man, but for now, pastor, pray for me. And I'll pray for you, absolutely. Meanwhile, holes and buckets and holes and buckets and holes and buckets. We see it being modeled right here in this moment. Jonathan's going, let's go. Influencers get back in the game. Influencers get in the game. For some of you, it's get back in the game. For some of you, it's take that first step as a believer and start getting in. I'm not going to just watch it. I'm going to be involved. And now here's what's happened during that time when all this is happening with Jonathan. The king has gotten lazy. The priests are lazy. And the enemy, our enemy loves lazy. He loves lazy. Our enemy, and he's been taking ground, even in our own community, out of laziness. When we're lazy in anything, it doesn't go well. When you're stagnant or lazy in your marriage, there's going to be problems. When you're stagnant and lazy when it comes to raising your family, there's going to be problems. When we're stagnant as the people at the church and we don't get out and kind of break down the walls in a community, the enemy builds his walls. And he builds walls around people, around political divisions and racial divisions and hate and anger and people doing things to one another. The enemy's taking ground and he's building those walls. He's putting walls around the church hoping that we will just stay comfortable kind of right where we are on the outskirts. God calls us though as believers to say, no, we break down walls. We break down walls in marriage. We break down walls of race. We break down walls of social economic differences, uh, political differences, because the gospel prevails. It's love. God is asking, calling us out as believers to say, hey, get out of the outskirts. Get involved. Be in the battle. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says this. Farmers who wait for the perfect weather, they never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. You have dreams. You have destiny. You got a calling. You got a movement. You're a believer in Christ. We get up and go. Second Chronicles 16, 9. Because the Lord's eyes scan the whole world to strengthen those who are committed to him with all their hearts. First thing I just want to say right now is, again, I hope if some of you get this right already and you're an influencer in the faith, I hope that you're having a strengthening of your heart, knowing that God is doing this in, in your life. But then it says, your foolishness, though, means that you will have war on your hands from now on. This is, 
the reality is that you will always do battle on the inside until you finally get in the flow of moving with God. If you just, you're at war. And I hear people say, Pastor, I'm, I'm not at war with God. I'm just not, just not involved. You're either on a flow with God or you're not. I talk to a men, you know, I, I host a trip. I take a trip every year. We go on a little journey, wild at heart. We take some men on this little five-day journey to recalibrate their heart and their mind for the things of God. And it's a powerful trip. But one of the things I run into commonly with the men, commonality of the men on the trip that are going is many of them are dealing with maybe an anger on the inside and they don't understand where it came from. Frustration, temper, you know, little thing happens and they flip out in life, you know, somebody cuts them off in traffic and they go ballistic and they're like, I don't know where this comes from. And a lot of men are carrying something like a war on the inside because they know there was something they believed they were promised or they know there was something for their life that they wanted to accomplish and they believed for it and they're not there. They feel like they're off track. They're not where they want to be. And one of the things that we discover in a lot of those men is they're just at war with the this kind of movement of the things of God. They're not on a pathway for God. And once you start journeying with God, you see this cessation of hostilities for sure, but also a movement of peace in your life because you're starting to be on a journey with God. And I would argue that it's not just with men, it's with women as well. Of course, when we're not moving with God, there's something on the inside that we battle and say, something's not right in my life. It's, something's out of whack. So the first thing we do is we say, I want to get in the game. Here's the second thing I put in your notes. You got to decide to renew your commitment to the vision and the leadership. Renew your commitment to the vision and the leadership. I want to share with you out of this scripture with Jonathan and the armor bearer how this plays out. It's very powerful. Remember I said, Jonathan says he wants to go do battle. And he grabs the armor bearer, goes with him, and they model something really powerful here. Here's, here's what I put, though, in my notes, and I think it's in yours. What is the armor bearer? It's someone who partners with the leader to accomplish the vision that God has given the leader. So, they're in this thing where people are taking sides. They decide to go. They're going to decide to go into the valley. Jonathan says to the armor bearer in 1 Samuel 14, 7, we're going to go, let's take this journey, and the armor bearer says, do what you think is best. I am with you completely, whatever you decide. Another translation says, I am with you heart and soul. I see what we're trying to accomplish here. And I believe, it, it, I gotta be wondering if there was a moment of doubt for the armor bearer, I, I would get it. You know, like it's, it, it's just us, like we're leaving the 600 and it's just gonna be me and you, like just the two of us. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. But no, no, actually, it seems as though the armor bearer says, I'm with you. And I think when I see this and I see what takes place, there's a belief from the armor bearer, as we just highlight him for just a moment going with Jonathan, there's a belief from the armor bearer that says, the vision of what we're about to do, it's right. And I trust you, Jonathan, with that vision. Two powerful things that take place. What makes a powerful church? A church that has a clear vision and the church that has leaders who are living in the character and the right living of the things of God that have a connection with that vision and you could trust. I think about our youth ministry and Pastor Rusty and he has a vision to reach our youth and people connect and say, let's go. It's a church as a whole. I lead this church and say, okay, there's a vision here to reach our community and people over the years, over all these years have said, yes, I get it, let's go. And I've said over and over and over again, if you don't like the vision of our church or you don't like the leadership of the church, okay, go someplace where you can go and give and serve and take out this vision, let it play out in your life and, and trust a leader and trust the vision. But when you partner with a great vision, with great leadership, big things can happen. We're talking about you and I taking the fundamentals of our faith, 
and constantly putting into action. You know it's my job every weekend to teach you the fundamentals of the faith. And then it's your job to take those fundamentals and play out, dig deeper with those fundamentals, dig deeper into God's word, dig deeper into your influence more and more. It's my job to reveal to you influence, reveal to you opportunities. You take the ball and run from it there. Fundamentals, though, are important. When I was growing up, I played Little League Baseball. Some of you did. And I remember we had this coach that took over a team. It was a new team that I was on. It was a new team for the coach. His son was playing on the team, and he was like, we got two years. I'm going to be here. The coach said, two years. And we're going to work through this. And in the first year, uh, the coach said, uh, we're all young. We're going to be together next year. We're all young this year. I'm going to start week one. We're going to teach the fundamentals. In fact, I, I so loved it. My, I, I played three years on this team. The third year, my dad coached and, and did the same thing as well. And so it was really cool. But it all started in this moment with this, with this first coach. And he says, here's what we're going to do. Every day, we're going to work on the fundamentals. We had all these young kids there. And we're all, we're all kind of going through this and like it, it was if you know baseball it's like okay we're going to learn how to field how to field a ground ball how to field a fly ball how to lay down a bunt how to turn a double play how to be here positioning all this stuff you know it's the basics how to hit the cutoff man all the stuff you learn and it was day in day out fundamentals and the coach said hey look it's not going to be an easy year that's my goal this year and I remember the first game of the season like it was terrible several games like 10 run rule you know he's just getting bludgeoned but he told us he said it's going to be rough but over time and in the next year we're going to do something big we all i think towards the end of that year we started winning some games the next year comes fundamentals again fundamentals and we're digging now we're growing in those fundamentals and all of a sudden we start winning games right out of the gate and we end up winning the championship being a part of that watching at the end of the year the vision and the leader all right the leader says here's the fundamentals watch me I'm going to teach you I'm going to teach you here's the vision it's going to be a rough first year but we're going to win the next year I got behind it and it played out and I love being a part of seeing that leadership, vision, vision, leadership. I teach you every week here, my goal is to get those fundamentals to you. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 4. Paul says this, I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you, my beloved children, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you, so I urge you to imitate me. You get a leader, He's imitating the things of life, family, character, whatever it may be. He casts a vision. The vision is good. People get behind it. And that's been the story of New Walk for so many years. And I think those of you who have figured that out and you've stepped up and said, I'm, I'm ready. Let, let's get going. You know, when we do Easter at New Walk, it's kind of one of those reset moments, I think, for all of us to say, how am I doing on my own fundamentals. Uh, every week here at our church, there's a part where we're growing with those fundamentals, but there's also an understanding, if you're a believer, that it's not about me. There are others too, and so we're equipping to go out, leave the church, and go be the church. We do that every week, and we understand that, but I think it's more heightened at Easter because it's that moment where as believers, we understand this weekend's about getting the gospel to people, and we're going to do our part, and all these fundamentals are at play when you come into a weekend at Easter at New Walk, you know, where, okay, we're going to invite, and we're going to bring somebody with us, so we're going we're gonna to do evangelism, and we're going to kind of get them in the door, and we're going to make sure that we're serving, and we're going to have a place where we're serving, because that's what believers do, and so we're serving, and we're going to make sure we're supporting it, because Easter at New Walk happens when God's people support it financially, and so we're going to make sure we're involved, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to dig in, and we're going to get ready and prepare for Easter at New Walk, and it's kind of that reset moment that says, hey, am I taking part in everything I can take part in to make sure that people in our community have those walls torn down and they can come to know Jesus? Let me share with you some of the things happening at Easter at New Walk, see if you can uh, follow with me here and see what's happening. We have eight different services, and so we have, we have um, 
you'll see we have, uh, it goes on the 7th, 8th, and 9th, all right? 7th, 8th, and 9th. And what we're going to have this year, it's a little bit different. Uh, in the past, we would do kick off kind of with one glow hunt we, we would have on, on the first night. Well, we're going to have two glow hunts because they're pretty, they become so popular. And then also the helicopter egg drops as well. So this tells you, you know, the 7th and 8th at 7 p.m. there is when we're having the glow hunts. And then when is the helicopter going to be here on the Saturday and the Sunday there, those are those days. It tells you when the helicopter uh, is going to be around. And so it kind of split those times up into two different sections there for you to see. But yeah, which ones are you bringing people to? How are you inviting? How are you sharing? It, cards that are on your seat for Easter and the cards that we got stacks at the door on your way out. How are you going to utilize them? Social media. Also just personal invites as you're inviting people to this big weekend. Which weekend Which weekend opportunity are you serving at? Which part, where are you plugged in as a believer to influence others? How are you praying and preparing your heart to get ready for a huge weekend, praying for people that are gonna be coming into our doors? How are you supporting it financially? It's like this moment where we all realize, hey, this is huge for our community. Are you ready to influence in just a few weeks. I asked last week, I said, hey, if you are not on one of these teams that we have for, for serving, or especially if you could help us, we have 60 spots available for our glow hunt and, and egg drop where we need people who are willing to help us. If you are willing to get out of the outskirts and step in and start helping, easy on road, not in road, but on road to starting to serving at our church. You can go to boot camp, which is next week, you can let us know on the back of your card. There's a place for you to tell us that you, you want to go to boot camp. If you'll come next week during this time, be in the cafe. So you could come at 930, come to church, then go to the cafe afterwards. Go to boot camp. They'll teach you about the vision of our church, how you want to get behind it, and then send you off to be a part of influencing for the kingdom here at our church. If you can help us, let us know on the back of your Connect card. Here's the next thing I want to share with you. You've got to decide to show yourself. I had uh, originally, my fill-in here was going to be expose yourself, but that's not a good one anymore, so <laughs> moved away from that one. But there is something here where Jonathan and the armor bearer, they move out from the shade and the outskirts and step out into that valley. Show yourself. 1 Samuel 14, 6. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. How can uh, he can win a battle, whether he has many warriors or only a few? It goes on in verse 8. All right, then Jonathan said to him, let's go. They're going to cross over, and look at this. He says, we're going to let them see us. He's not afraid to step out against the adversary. You know why he's not afraid? Because he knows his God's bigger. Is God's bigger than the enemy. It doesn't matter if they got two or 600. If God is with us, then who could be against us? They understand that them plus God is the majority, it's the win. I think in our culture today, this is what's hurting, damaging the church and the Christians in the church. They're scared to put themselves out there and speak boldly and talk boldly about Jesus because what will people say and will they not like me? And if I share the Bible and the fact that so many people are missing the scriptures, what will people say? Will I get negative comments or will people think I'm this, that, or the other? And so the Christians are on the outskirts. I want to say to you, if you are willing to step out and be bold for the sake of Jesus Christ, you will win. You're winning when you do that. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Step out and say, here I am, Satan. I'm ready to do battle against you. I wrote this in your notes. Your success on this journey as an influencer does not depend on what you have. It depends on you making that decision to partner with God and what he does with you. What he does with you. People say, ah, oh, you know, I... I don't have very much, you know, like I, Pastor Gary, I don't feel like I can give to support the church because I just don't have very much. No, you push past that, that thinking of the enemy that a little bit doesn't matter. 
Pastor Gary, I don't know very much about the Bible. I don't feel like being a part of a small group, you know, because there's probably all theologians in a small group at our church. No. Small steps. Small steps can start to make a huge difference. God's calling us out. Take those small steps. Folks, there's something bigger at stake, though. It's our small steps partnering with God to make a difference in our community. And right now, right now, if you're in East Pasco, right now, and this is what keeps me going, is I know well over 80, 85% of the people in our community, probably more, if they were to die today, they're not spending an eternity in heaven. They're gonna be separated from God forever. It's why I can't stay on the outskirts. And what I would challenge you is to understand and to dig in this time. We get ready for Easter. Immerse yourself in the understanding that there are people who are going to spend an eternity in hell. And if you don't get off the outskirts, what you're saying to those people who need your influence is you're giving them the middle finger and saying, I don't care if you go to hell. I'm gonna challenge you. Get off the outskirts. As a Christian, and start making a difference. Be the influencer. And the small steps matter. I said that before. Zechariah 4.10 says this. Do not despise these small beginnings. Talk about the, the work of the temple and doing the things for the Lord. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. See the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. Don't despise the small step that you take today. So oh, I'm just only going to help the kids, you know, with the eggs. It's a big first step in bringing joy in those kids' hearts when they're here and they enjoy being a part of the church and they say to their parents they want to come back. A small beginning, that means so much. God rejoices when we take that small step, when we cross into the valley, when we show ourselves and say, I am ready to get in the game, to be an influencer. And in Haggai 2.19, it says this, and this is what we look ahead to when we keep moving forward. It says this, now think ahead from this same day, this 24th day of the ninth month. Think ahead when the temple rebuilding was launched. Think forward, has anything in your fields, vine, fig tree, pomegranate, olive tree, has it failed to flourish? Has anything failed to flourish once you begin? You're going to discover, here's what he said, from now on, you can count on a blessing. Because you took the steps, and you're in that journey of being an influencer. God blesses it when we decide to get started, get involved in being an influencer. I put this last thing in your notes, influencing with God and for God brings you real life, not this fake way of living. Real life, not this holes and buckets living. Real life, and it eliminates that regret. Because now you know, like you're moving with God, and you're in this journey with him, and you're making a difference with your life, not squandering it. Let's pray. God, you're revealing maybe to a group here and they're Christians and they love you, Lord, and they are doing this, they are influencing. And God, I thank you. May today be a reminder, a reassurance for them in their influential journey. Maybe right now, God, there's somebody you're bringing out from the outskirts. They'll take a small step. It's important, but it's a small step and they're ready. Maybe they're getting back in the game. Maybe the Maybe it's for the first time they're getting involved being an influencer. God, so many opportunities we get ready. These fundamentals of our faith, Easter at New Walk. God, strengthen us, take those steps. But maybe in our room, we have so many people here right now, people that maybe are watching online, you're watching this, you're listening within the sound of my voice, and you're one of these. You're, you're just, you're not with God. You're against him. You're, you're at war, and you don't even realize you've been in that battle so long. You've been, going against God so long. You're just in a messy place. Holes and buckets and hungry for more, but you can't ever seem to get filled. God says, that's a, such a low level way of living. Would you turn to God who's expansive, magnificent, powerful, creative, all-knowing, doing a work inside of humanity? Would you turn to him and say, God, I want to have a life with you. God says, great, Let's go, first step, forgiveness of your sin. God says, I gave a gift of Jesus Christ so that all who wanted to trust in the forgiveness of the, through the Son, Jesus Christ, could have a journey with me. Their sin could be forgiven because forgiven people are connected
connected to God. And so God says, I want to see your sin washed so that you can start new today. Would you just receive that gift, the cross of Jesus Christ? God demanded a pure blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus became it once and for all. And today you're receiving that forgiveness. You're making that decision to begin a new journey in your life, a relationship with God. God, today I surrender in Jesus' name. Amen.